My name is Chelsea Miernick and I'm an environmental science student attending Wayne State University here to discuss the threat of microplastics on our aquatic ecosystems. From the oceans to inland lakes and rivers, plastics are the most widespread pollutant contaminants on Earth, posing a risk to ecosystems and human life around the world. As humans continue to build their reliance on plastics as a resource for everyday lifestyles, they will continue to build up in our aquatic ecosystems, leaving permanent impacts as microplastics. Now let's begin with the emergence of plastics. Plastic was first invented in 1869 by an individual named John Wesley Hyatt, who took cellulose from cotton fiber and made a synthetic polymer. This newly discovered product was invented as an alternative to ivory. Then, in 1907, a man named Leo Backlund created a new form of plastic called bakelite, which was made from all inorganic sources. This new plastic was more similar to the everyday plastics used today and had less limits than Hyatt's invention. This plastic became mass-produced and could be shaped into any material needed by humans, such as kitchen items, toys, jewelry, firearms, and more. Acolyte was also known for its characteristic non-conductivity with electricity, which allowed it to be used to make electrical items such as phones, computers, and radios. This invention would prove to be a transformative discovery for the rest of history. Fast forward, as industrialism continued to rise, so did the usage of plastics. As world wars raged, countries like the U.S. needed materials to conserve natural resources, so plastic was used to make multitudes of materials, from war products to everyday utensils. It was actually found that during World War II, plastic production in the United States increased by 300%. The positive view of plastics then began to degrade when the first plastic pollutants were found in the oceans in the 1960s, and they would prove to be a growing issue, posing risks to human, wildlife, and environmental health in the future. Now looking at today, it is known that around one truckload of plastic is going into the ocean every minute, adding up to about 8 million tons of plastic per year. It's predicted that soon there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish if something does not change. However, plastics are not only an issue in the world's oceans. They are also found in our freshwater sources like Michigan's vital Great Lakes resource. It has been discovered that around 22 million pounds of plastic enter the Great Lakes per year, according to the Rochester Institute of Technology. This plastic in our water is not only composed of the litter you see washing up on beaches or floating on the surfaces of oceans or lakes. Much of the problem lies in what cannot be seen, the microplastics, an invisible yet substantial problem in our ecosystems, which can lead to a chain reaction of further issues. So you might be wondering, what are microplastics and how do they become microplastics? Let's break down what actually makes these everyday plastic items that have become a necessity to so many people of today and can end up in our water resources as plastic or microplastic pollutants. Plastics are based on polymers, which are combinations of many repeating bonded units, and to make them into materials fit for use, they are processed with a range of chemical additives. These additives adjust the plastic's properties to make them suitable for their intended purpose. Both the additives and the complex structure of plastics is what makes them slowly decomposable and sometimes even dangerous to public and environmental health. So as plastics are discarded into the environment or thrown away into landfills, they begin to break down at a slow rate, which can form smaller and smaller bits of plastic known as microplastics. Microplastics are characterized specifically as pieces of plastic less than 5 millimeters long. This is comparable to the size of around half of one pea from a pea pod. Microplastics can also be further categorized into either primary or secondary microplastics, according to their source. Primary microplastics are purposely manufactured to be the small size that they are. They're commonly spoken about as microbeads, which are the small plastic balls that are used in sanitary products such as face wash, toothpaste, makeup, and more. Secondary microplastics are formed from larger plastics that break down over time and release microplastic-sized particles into the environment. This breakdown can result from waves, sunlight, or other forms of physical abrasion on mismanaged wastes. Microplastics can actually be more dangerous because of their significantly small size. They have the capability to make it past our water filtration systems, and wildlife can consume them without knowing it. After they consume the microplastics, they can then enter our systems if we eat the aquatic wildlife. And as the microplastics enter our systems, so do the chemicals that they may have been treated with, 
which can have a detrimental effect on our health as well as the health of animals. So where are all of these plastic pollutants coming from? Microplastics can enter the water ecosystems through a variety of sources, such as one-use items like water bottles, wrappers, containers, utensils, and more, which can be degraded down into microplastics from weathering and wave action. They can come from mismanaged factory discharge or even stormwater runoff. These sources can also be categorized according to where they're coming from. There is non-point source pollution, which is the main source of pollution, and it is the result of runoff, which carries pollutants from a variety of sources into the same area as stormwater flows into one body of water. This source of pollution can bring in plastic from places far away from the body of water that they're ending up in. There is also point source pollution, which comes from a single source. They have larger impacts on the environment, but they happen less often. An example of this would be discharge from factories or treatment plants located near a water source. Now let's talk about plastic pollution in the oceans. Most of the information circulating in society today about plastic pollution is focused on the oceans and the huge plastic patches accumulating within them. The first observations of plastic in the ocean were made in the 1960s in the western North Atlantic Ocean and the issue has just been growing since. The plastics that enter Earth's oceans end up in ocean gyres, which are the systems of ocean currents which collect plastic pollution in patches across the ocean. While microplastics still pose an issue in the oceans, larger plastics are the main problem, causing hazards for wildlife and habitat degradation. There are around 269,000 tons of plastic per every square mile of the ocean, which ends up in the digestive tracts of marine organisms and sometimes humans that eat these organisms. Marine animals have also been known to get tangled up in larger pieces of plastic in the oceans, inhibiting their mobility and sometimes being fatal. Oceans are a widespread resource across the world, so countries all over are facing the impacts of plastic pollution in the oceans. Which is why most research, education, and advocating is done focusing on the issue of plastic and microplastics in the oceans. However, this is not the only place where plastic pollutants are having impacts. Plastics are becoming increasingly more prominent in freshwater inland lakes and river ecosystems, one of these being the Great Lakes and their surroundings. Let's take a moment to talk about the extreme importance of Michigan's Great Lakes as a freshwater resource. Out of all the water on Earth, less than 3% of it is freshwater that is available for drinking. Out of this 3% of freshwater, 80% of it is frozen in ice caps and glaciers, so it's unusable. This leaves only about one-fifth of all the fresh water on Earth available as a resource for drinking. Michigan's Great Lakes hold about 20% of this freshwater supply, and about 90% of the United States' total fresh water. 40 million residents of the United States and Canada depend on this ecosystem for clean drinking water. So if microplastics continue to endanger this resource and risk it becoming destroyed, it would clearly be detrimental to these massive populations of people and wildlife that depend on the Great Lakes as a drinking source. This abundant amount of microplastics in the Great Lakes ecosystem can pose many dangers to living organisms who vitalize it as a resource. Microplastics may be taken up from the surrounding water habitat and sediment by animals who live in and around the Great Lakes, such as fish, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and more. This can occur directly through ingestion, skin absorption, or most commonly, through respiratory surfaces or gills. Microplastics entering the systems of animals in the environment can lead to a number of negative impacts, including inflammation of digestive or respiratory systems, the alteration of DNA, behavioral changes, and more. Also, the animals around this habitat that ingest microplastics frequently may succumb to starvation. This can happen because as organisms ingest the plastics, they become full and no longer feel the need to eat more. However, these plastics they have ingested have no nutritional value so the organisms will die of starvation. The additives and chemicals that are intentionally added into plastics during production for color or performance can also leave humans at risk, who are unaware that they are coming into contact with microplastics. Microplastics in the Great Lakes can enter the human system from a variety of scenarios, such as through aquatic organisms being eaten, drinking a contaminated water supply, from fruits and vegetables taking up plastics from soils or contaminated irrigation, and more. People have also been known to become exposed to microplastics through inhalation. When microplastics disperse themselves through the air, they break down smaller and can disperse farther distances, where humans can inhale them in the form of dust or during rain events without knowing it. This inhalation of microplastics can lead to respiratory distress, inflammation of the lungs, and bronchioles, which can lead to asthma and even autoimmune diseases. A variety of chemicals are used in plastic products, some of which are more dangerous than others. 
Each of these can have differing impacts on people who come into contact with them. Although plastics of any form are not meant to be in the human system and can pose health risks. The size and shape of microplastic entering a human body is also very significant to its resulting impacts. Studies have shown that microplastics smaller than 20 micrometers can penetrate organs, while those around 10 micrometers can access all organs, cross cell membranes, and even enter the placenta in child-rearing women. It is clear that microplastic pollutants are becoming an increasing danger to ecosystems and living organisms, so how can this issue be fixed? Given the accelerated rate that society is producing plastics, the different sectors of the economy, and the relatively limited knowledge about them, it is obvious how difficult it can be to find solutions to the plastic problem in aquatic ecosystems. Consequently, leaks of microplastics to the terrestrial and aquatic environments occur throughout the supply chain, or in the form of pre-production spills, littering, or irresponsible waste management. With this being said, the easiest way to look into fixing the microplastics issue is to start at the source. America has a strong market-based economy, so solutions that will make a significant impact will take economic goals strongly into account. By looking in terms of differing economic models to understand how we can improve the plastic issue from the production source. Currently, there are two main paths of economic models studied around commercial plastic production and distribution. One of these will leave a higher amount of plastic spillage and pollutants during production, while the other will reduce the amount of plastic litter spilling into the watershed. The first and most commonly used today in America is the linear economic model. In this model, products are manufactured using all new resources, without taking conservation measures into account. During production, much of the product's value is lost because of the amount of leakage throughout its life cycle. This can be through pellet loss, littering, combined sewage overflow, transport loss, improper waste storage, or poorly designed products that are easily lost in the environment and difficult to recover, like wrappers, packaging, small one-use plastics, and others. Within the linear economic model, only a minuscule amount of plastic is recycled for remanufacture. The majority of it is destroyed by incineration, which releases greenhouse gases, just adding to another form of degradation to the environment. The second economic model is a circular economic system. This is the ideal model for more sustainable plastic production and use in a strong market-based system like America. In this system, a high percentage of recycled content is used as the materials to make new products and the remainder is taken from sustainable sources. Leakages under this system are decreased through increased policy, public awareness, and proper consumer waste handling. In order to execute an economic system such as this one, it requires adaption and agreement among all community members. These include designing for reuse instead of a use once and throw away mindset, discourage littering that can be set into waterways from runoff, introduce deposit returns, and ensure high recycling in the community and at the factory levels. A circular economic system would put a large emphasis on preventative measures for environmental problems that are caused by excessive plastic leakage. Implementing this economic plan is much more cost-effective and environmentally friendly than most common post-consumer cleanup schemes that tend to be economically and technologically unfeasible. Overall, the most achievable way to reduce plastic pollution into our waterways is to implement an economic system that can reduce plastic at the source, and one that takes environmental costs and benefits into account, as well as their consumers. Some people may be wondering, on an individual level, what can I do to help? Although this problem may seem too big for any single one of us to handle, there are several things that each person can do, as an individual, to make a difference in the plastic pollution problem in our waterways. Some things that we can keep in mind in order to minimize plastic waste in our own lifestyles include reduce, reuse, and recycle. You hear this statement all the time, but it's truly a great thing to think about when attempting to minimize your own plastic consumption. First of all, we can try to reduce. Reduce your individual use of disposable plastic items as much as possible. We can do this by using alternatives to one-use everyday plastic items by making simple swaps such as reusable grocery bags in place of plastic bags when shopping, reusable water bottles or coffee cups, water filters for drinking water at home, buying from secondhand clothing stores, reusable plastic containers for leftovers or takeout from restaurants, and any other alternatives that you can think of. As an individual, you can also try to pay attention to ingredients on beauty supplies, such as face washes, makeup, and toothpaste, to ensure that they do not contain microplastic beads that will eventually end up in our waterways. 
Some commonly used microbead ingredients to look out for on bottles include polyethylene, or PE for short, polypropylene, or PP for short, and nylon. Secondly, we can remember to reuse. When it is necessary to use plastic items, reuse them as much as possible. Also, attempt to take advantage of reusing your plastic alternative items as often as you can. You can try to stay accountable for this by keeping extra bags, reusable water bottles, and containers in the car at all times in case you forget to bring them or you want to eat out at the last minute. Lastly, recycle. When it is necessary that you use one-use plastic items that must be disposed of, be sure that you recycle them instead of just throwing them away. Even though sometimes it may feel as though you, as a single person, are helpless in making a difference in such a widespread issue, such as the plastic problem, there is always something you can do, no matter how small it may seem. Overall, the problem with plastics is that modern society has become extremely reliant on them as a resource, for a wide variety of uses. Plastics have led us to some of the greatest creations that people now depend on, such as computers, cell phones, and even some medicines. Forming products from plastic material also makes them cheaper than if they were to be made with natural materials, so they are more affordable for individuals who are from lower income classes. These reasons and more make it very difficult to try to convince humans to live a plastic-free lifestyle. Because of our own built-up reliance, it has made it seem impossible. Currently, scientists around the world are working towards making a more environmentally safe approach to plastics, one that won't cause as much damage to aquatic organisms that become victim to consuming plastic pollution. Making plastics biodegradable or discovering a way to completely recycle plastics may be a more realistic solution to the plastic pollution facing us today. However, until these innovations are made, individuals can make self-responsible choices when it comes to decreasing their own plastic waste. Plastics are obviously posing a threat to aquatic ecosystems and the organisms within them, but the hard truth is that humankind is always going to need these materials or materials similar to them. And an ideal solution would be to prevent as much plastic as possible from entering the waterways, as well as continuing to work towards innovations that would allow us to vitalize plastics as a resource without destroying our ecosystems at the same time.